Hi everyone, my name is Oskar Svensson and I work as a program manager for the MES solutions at Volvo Cars Engines. I'm here today to take you through what the team, MES team, consisting of team members from Volvo Car Engine and General Electric has achieved so far. And in the end, we will have a look into how we view the future. The agenda for today's presentation consists of four main areas, where we start with me giving you a short introduction to Volvo Car Engine's business. We move on to our journey, our results, and then we have a brief view at what the future has to offer and challenge us with. So starting with our business, as always, it has changed quite a lot, given that we celebrated our 150th anniversary last year. Uh, we have been around since the combustion and made its first revolutions. The very basic still remains the same, but looking into the details where all the differences made, there are few to none similarities. The coming decade will generate even bigger changes uh, something I will come back to in the very end of the presentation, but I can reveal already now that it will be digital and it will be based on data. Volvo Car Engine's production consists of two facilities, one in Skövde, Sweden, and one in Chengdu, China. Uh, the part of the plant which produces car engines, Skövde, fully opened in, in 1991, and the Chengdu plant opened with assembly of engines in 2013. The total production volumes of the two plants during 2019 was 750,000 units and that was distributed over 65 different variants. Both our plants produce combustion engines and electrical motors for Volvo cars. Our main product is still the combustion engine, which consists of multiple in-house produced and procured components. Our production is mainly divided into three areas, machining, where all the major machine components is internally produced from blanks. This is a highly automated machining situation where the stations, which is performing drilling, milling, threading, grinding, pruning, and even turning machining. Then we have the base assembly area, and this is where we mainly assemble the internal components of the engine. This is a mixture of automated and manual assembly stations uh, of both internal produced and procured materials. The final assembly area is where we mainly assemble the outer components of the engine. Here we utilize manual stations, which consume mainly procured components. So this picture contains a lot of information, uh, but what is important for us, our MES journey, is that this is mass production of sophisticated product in a global environment with very high quality demands. And this will lead us to the part where I will introduce us, you to our journey so far. When it was time to start a new production facility in Shangku, we realized that our legacy solutions was a dead end. So this is actually where our journey starts in 2013. Uh, it has not been a smooth paved highway, rather the opposite. It has taken stubbornness and hard work from the whole team. And when I say the whole team, I also include the GE services team. But now we have an excellent cooperation and we have a very competent solution to build our future on. What you see in front of you now, is the important steps we have gone through until today. We will come back to this very picture throughout the part, uh, part of the presentation, and it will serve as both a timeline and an agenda for this part. So starting with the item smart in red, how we selected prophecy and developed the FDS, the functional design specification, we will carry on. So we started with creating the want state and the strategy for 2020 for Volvo cars engines. Following some examples uh, we, where we derived the business requirement on the MES strategy from our business strategy. So we need a global alignment and way of working where we could utilize the same solution in both our China plant and our Swedish plant. Continuous cost and cash improvements we need better data to understand how to contribute. We need to optimize the total value chain all the way from supplier to customer. We need to do and need a better data from the production to do this. Also, we wanted to utilize the pool thinking. The, we need to plan what was going out from the plant, so we must keep track of every engine. Productivity by reducing waste and losses. We need to start recording our losses, which we did not do properly before. And we needed to optimize and have a sustainable supplier base management. So therefore we need to manage multiple supply situations with full traceability where one component can come from multiple suppliers. All this boils down to our strategic 
guiding document, the FDS, a stepping stone for our solution to come. And this was based on common understanding from both GE and Volvo cars. From the FDS, we then derived the fundamental architecture of how to utilize the prophecy solution. The Volvo car engine solution we called Prime. One cornerstone in the new architecture was the adaptation of the i 95 equipment structure. If you remember the slides describing our main product and production, uh, our aim was to create the MES solution which could support both machining with highly automated stations, base assembly which had a mixture of automated and manual station, and final assembly with manual stations. So given our shoes and production strategy, we early on concluded that all station was to be viewed as a generic station following the same basic concept. It should be no limitation in how to set up the line with different combination of status, station types. Uh, or, and the activity should be able to be performed in stations and that was a generic modular way of designing them. When the basic architecture was designed, we still uh, produced only combustion engines. And that is still our main product. But since we have created an architecture building on these fundamentals, we could start producing new products with our existing MES without changes. We are now producing both combustion engines and electrical motors with our new MES solution, as well as producing several components ourselves, which we previously bought. But as I said before, not everything has proceeded smooth. The first implementation was a real challenge. Uh, during this implementation, I actually joined this interesting journey, so I'm a key witness to what I will present to you in the following slide. During the first installation, we experienced team issues, cooperation problems, mistrust from the local management, misunderstanding, budget problems, delivery problems, and performance problems. So we knew that there was a lot of challenges that had to be dealt with going forward, even though production started as planned. Coming out from the first implementation in Shanghai, some of the key items to address was the cooperation problems and the quality problems. As you can see, we performed actions to refine the technical solution, which was absolutely mandatory before deploying the software to the Kölde plant. And I will not go into these details, but draw the focus on the key components that changed our journey to success story. First of all, we needed to build a new team. And then we needed to change the way we developed the solution. This can sound very, very basic. But it's amazing how often projects fail because of basics. We had understood that we needed to form one team, which was a common team uh, with Volvo and GE, and we needed to evolve the plant and the operators early. Uh, the reorganization of our team and how we operated improved the understanding and gave us the control of what we developed and how we developed. Then we had the test driven approach, which can also seem like something obvious. Now that we have implemented it, we have a hard time understanding that we could ever operate in a different way. This is also something which is evolving. We continuously get better and better in understanding how to write test cases and why, what might be interconnected with each other. This is uh, organizational learning as well. Uh, the documented test cases contain knowledge of our experts. And basically you can say that no development is performed until we have written the test cases. And the test cases is in turn based on the business requirement from a certain capability. Once everything is developed, um, then we uh, use the test cases to verify that new code is working as expected with our new business capability. And as you all understand, the test cases are then reused for regression tests. This significantly increased the quality and precision of the deliveries. Having performed this basic step, we also saw the true potential of what could be achieved. So we started thinking about an agile approach and a sprint-based development. And this I will come back to later in the presentation. Once we saw that we could properly order new capabilities and that the capabilities were properly developed, we turned our heads to the next big challenges. The governance of what to order and the utilization of the capabilities once they was put into place was a real challenge. Uh, so we made a cross-functional governance structure uh, and we used experts from the production team, which we called super users, to take us uh, on in this journey. Earlier, the IT development was driven by each project and there was no strategy for a long-term roadmap of the applications. So sub-optimizations due to uncoordinate, uncoordinated demands occurred from time to time. Uh, our answer to this was to create a governance structure which created uh, processes and coordinated the business requirement. 
We had also seen great variety of the end user adaptation of uh, MES uh, and the capabilities within it. We received a request for new capabilities, which already existed in the solution. And in general, there was a mistrust of the capabilities, which eventually worked. So we decided to make our very best users to super users. And that made them a MES ambassador in their own organization. So the end customer in our case, the production organization, uh, this improved uh, the change management a lot, and it led to better user certification and utilization of our capabilities. We have already touched uh, on the sprint-based development, and in some way, it's, uh, we moved seamlessly into this way of working. During this time, we tested different methods, and we learned what's right for our team in the current constellation. What is really characterizing for this uh, stretch out phase uh, of our journey is that we embraced agile methodologies, including backlog refinements, sprint planning, demos, retrospective, or whatever you want to call them. This increased the involvement and understanding of the whole team. Lead time to business realization was decreased further, but the real benefit was that we were able to reprioritize after each sprint. Our roadmap defined in the FDS always guided us and provided us with a high level planning, uh, which was then broken down, prioritized and planned for each sprint. During this time, uh, we had uh, improved the way of working quite a lot, but the actual had code has uh, had some changes as well. So if you recall the challenges from the first implementation in Shanghai Ku, we had finally reached a point where we could have a fresh start and we could use, utilize the same code in both plants. Since one year now, we are running the same code in both Changku and Hubde. Our goal was actually realized. The carryback to Changku resulted in a lot of new capabilities and as well as improved performance and better stability of the application. The release itself was done with zero downtime and zero problems. So our actions has paid off. So a quick summary of journey in this part of the presentation, our results and findings are we are now in control of our business capabilities, no more sub-optimization. It has been quite a journey with both ups and downs, and the results which we have achieved is something we can proudly build our future on. All the way back in 2013, we started building for the future by creating a strategic document, the FDS. During the first implementation in Shanghai we had to learn a lot of things the hard way, but therefore we started building one common team to work um, with the following developments. And we improved the quality and the precision of the development by moving to, test -driven method to the test-driven methodology. Uh, also, the cross-functional uh, governance team, uh, which was set up to make the priorities and uh, decide on what capabilities to, the capabilities to develop, uh, was really key in making this a better situation. Then we had the super users, which improved the um, change management a lot. And then in the end, we moved to the sprint-based developments. So in total, we've improved our cost of ownership, quality, stability, and the total time for business improvements. Now, a short elaboration on what the future has to offer. As always, our future will start with our business. There will be new technologies, and those which can support our business will be implemented. We see some examples for new business scenarios in the future. Our business will become more global. The demands on quality will increase a lot. The products will get more sophisticated and there will be a bigger product variety. We also see some upcoming trends in the technology where artificial intelligence enables new types of analysis and predictability. Automation of user interface testing provide higher quality. Continuous deployment shortens the lead time and the enhanced uh, technology for handheld devices enable new business adaptations. All these aspects will have an impact on how we can execute our business and what value we can bring to our customers. Our common goal when building for the future is that we want technology that supports the business capabilities, and this is what we're going to implement. As always, start with business. We have actually changed quite a lot, but that will remain. Thank you for listening. And I hope you have found this as interesting as we have.